Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is October 6, 2020, and this is a special edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, things have gotten really serious as of late. Um, some of you know uh, that um, recently uh, an organization called Fair Mormon, which is an apologist nonprofit, has hired a few uh, actors to create some YouTube videos and some podcasts to try and defend and protect the Mormon church. And these videos uh, and, and podcasts have been very controversial. They're more edgy, they're more fun, but they're also uh, harsher. And, um, and the result has been a lot of uh, frustration by some, and in some cases, anger, because uh, in, in some senses, many people feel that these videos or podcasts are misleading. We're not going to be talking about that uh, necessarily from a historical context today. But what's become more serious is these uh, podcasts and YouTube channels uh, have, have uh, in some cases, encouraged uh, or used kind of demeaning language towards certain people, and in some cases have led to a lot of um, reactions that have been perceived as violent. And uh, in my particular case, uh, I've, I've recently had uh, people posting some very violent videos um, on, uh, on Twitter and elsewhere, and some very, very uh, dangerous um, also statements on Twitter and elsewhere. And so, uh, you know, I've filed police reports uh, after today. I'm also going to be talking to the FBI because these, uh, these comments made on Twitter and these videos posted on Twitter that have been reposted by people affiliated with Fair Mormon, um, you know, uh, because, because of sort of uh, the way that things have escalated in a violent way, um, I'm going to be reporting this to the FBI as, as I've already reported it to um, local police departments. I know Jeremy Runnels has also filed, uh, I believe, a report with the police. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. I'm feeling a little bit nervous, and so I'm a little bit jumbled and rambly this morning. But um, so uh, what I wanted to do was put together uh, a presentation with my friend Gerardo uh, trying to make sense of, of what's going on. And so I appreciate everyone who's joining us today. Um, uh, originally, I was so angry and so sad and so frustrated that I wanted to make a presentation that was filled with rage and anger, kind of lashing out and uh, hitting back and um, and sort of responding with with violence, with more violence and or with harsh rhetoric or with sharpness or with meanness. And I slept on it and woke up this morning just really committed to uh, trying to be as as respectful and as kind and as diplomatic and as constructive as possible. So that's my commitment to you today. I don't want to be attacking people personally. I don't want to be using harshness or meanness or criticism that's that's unhealthy or toxic. But I do want to educate and inform and explain as best as I can what's going on. Um, and I appreciate everyone who's joined us today uh, to check this out. Um, so without any further ado, the presentation that I uh, prepared today for you is called Nonprofits in the World of Mormonism. We're going to be talking about uh, the Open Stories Foundation, the More Good Foundation, Fair Mormon, the Interpreter Foundation, and Book of Mormon Central. Uh, I'm sure there are other nonprofits that are worth discussing, but uh, these are the ones that we're going to be talking about today. And I think you'll find this, this presentation useful. I wanted to begin just with my intentions. There have been a lot of people uh, really attacking me, making really horrible claims about uh, that I'm in this for the money, that I'm getting wealthy, that I'm, in fact, we'll be talking about claims where I'm destroying families for profit intentionally. Um, and I just wanted to start by, by doing my best to honestly and sincerely explain to you my intentions on why I started Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation. So it began in 2001 when I had my own faith crisis as a seminary teacher for the LDS Church. 
I went through a faith crisis while I was working at Microsoft in Seattle, and I realized just a few things. I realized that I wasn't taught uh, the true history of the Mormon Church, that I, I that I had not been taught that for all the years that I had lived and served in the church. And then as I went through my faith crisis and found others who were going through a faith crisis, I realized that the LDS Church was hurting certain groups of people, LGBTQ people, uh, sometimes women, people of color, sometimes children or youth, and and people who are in faith crisis. And I want to be clear. I sometimes people like to say that I hate the LDS Church, that I can't say anything good about it. That's not true. I uh, I I have so much love for Mormons, and I have so many happy and positive memories and experiences with the LDS Church. And I believe that today uh, there is a lot of good that the LDS Church does for its members, and sometimes even for people outside the church. So if when people like to say that I can't say a good thing about the church, they're not being honest. Uh, I, I do love the church. I want to help the church be healthier for its members. And uh, I want to help people who leave the church be more healthy as well. Um, so, uh, and then finally, I noticed that, uh, that there were many, many people going through a Mormon faith crisis early in the 2000s who, who needed support, and there were no resources available for those people. So for all these reasons, I decided to um, leave my, my high-paying job at Microsoft, where I was making over $200,000 a year towards the end. I went down to like $35,000 a year, started nine years of graduate school um, over like a 12-year period. Uh, my family went into debt because of this. We didn't have health insurance for many, many of those years. We weren't able to get mental health support for my family for many of those years. My kids shopped at DI, uh, and my kids and wife shopped at DI for clothes for many of those years. We made huge sacrifices to leave Microsoft, go back to graduate school, and to start Mormon Stories Podcast. And the reasons why I started Mormon Stories Podcast were to provide more accurate information to Mormons and LDS Church investigators, and I like to call that informed consent. I think that people who join a high-demand religion deserve to know the truth about the religion. So Mormon Stories has that intent. Um, it's to help the LDS Church do less harm to its members and to provide resources and community for people leaving Orthodox Mormonism or Mormonism altogether. So we wanted to help people in the church, help people out of the church, and just uh, help investigators. We just wanted to help, and that's honestly why we did it. Um, my ultimate goals then were basically less ignorance, distress, depression, less unnecessary divorce, less suicide in related to Mormonism, and then more informed consent, more knowledge, more hope, more healing, more community, and more joy. Okay, so without any further ado, let's get into kind of the financials, because there's a lot of people that claim that uh, ex-Mormons are getting rich um, off of ex-Mormonism, and, and I think that's dishonest. And so I'm going to just show you uh, the numbers. So this is how, uh, but, but before I, sorry, but before I talk about the, num the uh, money, I want to talk about the success we were able to have and why I started the OSF. So for those first five years, uh, I pretty much did Mormon Stories for free. We got trickles of donations before we started a nonprofit, but the money was was almost nothing. It was pennies per hour for, for my effort. But we had some decent success. So in 2005, we had about 12,000 downloads of Mormon Stories podcast that went up to 76,000 by 2006. And then by 2007, we had 222,000 downloads um, uh, of Mormon Stories podcast. And then, and then it went down a little bit in 2008 and 2009 as I was preparing for my psychology PhD. Now, I was super proud of those numbers at the time. I'm still super proud of it. Um, and, uh, you know, that was the first five years. I made pretty much no money. There was not a nonprofit. And we had modest success uh, uh, with the podcast. Okay, so um, what I realized is that uh, after five years of doing this for free or almost for free, uh, certainly at a big loss to my family in terms of money I could have been making in other ways, I decided in 2010 that I could not continue to do Mormon Stories podcast on a purely voluntary basis. Um, I just couldn't support my family anymore. We were going into debt. We we weren't able to care for the basic needs of my family. And so we needed to do something different. So what I did is I, I formed the Open Stories Foundation, 
which was a 501c3 nonprofit. And why did I form the, the Open Stories Foundation? I started it for uh, three reasons. To um, create an organization dedicated to helping Mormons and ex-Mormons, to allow me to work, uh, work towards doing Mormon stories full-time, and to allow listener donations to be tax deductible. And I basically went out to my podcast listeners and I said, listen, if you'll support me financially, I'll keep doing Mormon stories and try to have a bigger and a bigger impact than I did from 2005 to 2009. Uh, so that's what I did. I put out that call to my listeners. And so, you know, what was the result? What was the result of creating the Open Stories Foundation? And what I'm sharing for you now are the stats of what happened to downloads and views after I started the Mormon, the Open Stories Foundation in 2010. And what you'll see is starting in 2010, there was a huge jump from 169,000 uh, a year to 650,000 in 2010 to 700,000 in 2011. And then it became downloads and views because I started doing a uh, YouTube and Facebook uh, videos in addition to just um, downloads, thanks to the donations. And then things really skyrocketed, 2.4 million in 2013, 4.5 million in 2014, uh, jumped up to, to 6.2 million in 2017. By 2019, we had 7.6 million downloads and views. And so I think everybody can agree that uh, creating the nonprofit helped me be much more successful, helping me focus on the podcast, get better guests, better content, to be able to get better materials, microphones, cameras, equipment, all that stuff. That's why I created the Open Stories Foundation and that um, those are some of the results. Now, let's talk about the money. Um, people like to say that, that I'm getting rich off of the Open Stories Foundation. So what are the donations like for the Open Stories Foundation? Uh, we have always, some people like to say that we have not been financially transparent um, with our finances. That is not true. Um, if you go to openstoriesfoundation.org and you click in the menu, you can go to about and finances, and you can see that every year we've published financial reports from the very beginning, including my compensation. So that's, that's never been hidden. It's always been public. And people who claim that we've been dishonest about that are themselves being dishonest. Um, uh, so that, that's important. Um, also, all nonprofits have to publish what's called a 990, which is a, a tax return with the IRS showing their basic financial situations. And so anyone at any time can go to a, a 51c3 nonprofit, download their 990s, and look at how they've been spending their money on a basic level. And that includes the compensation for the directors. So that, that information's always been available. We've always been transparent. And in fact, we've gone, I believe, with the Open Stories Foundation, we've gone above and beyond um, by by publishing additional statements in addition to the 990s for most of the years. And you just have to go to Open Stories Foundation about and finances to see that that's true. Okay, so let's keep going. So um, what has been the revenue of the Open Stories Foundation? And I'm just gonna share this with you now. We share this every year with our donors and with the general public. In 2010, let's just say we had about $50,000 jumped up to about $100,000 in 2011, $200,000 in 2012. Then, uh, you know, uh, I had to get really focused on my PhD. We had some uh, some bumps happen within the Open Stories Foundation. Uh, so we got down to about 150,000 in 2013. By 2015, we climbed up back to about 200,000. And then since then I graduated with my PhD in clinical and counseling psychology. And so uh, what we see is huge jumps once I was able to focus on the Open Stories Foundation really full time. You see uh, in 2016, we're over 300,000. In 2017, we're over 400,000. And by 2018, we almost hit $500,000. Now, um, I'm sure that a lot of you think that's a lot of money. And I'm ecstatic uh, with what we were able to accomplish. And I'm so incredibly grateful to everyone who's donated to the Open Stories Foundation. Um, your donations have meant the world to me, to us, to my family, to all the listeners. We could not have reached millions and millions of downloads and views and hundreds of thousands of listeners on the podcast without your donations. So thank you. Um, thank you. 
Now, how much in total has the Open Stories Foundation raised over our entire life? Here are here are my best uh, estimate of of the numbers: two point one million dollars, um, and that's how much if you add all of the donations together for the entire life of the nonprofit. And let me just be clear: that money has not gone to me. For most of the time, uh, I, I have made half or less. For most of my time at the Open Stories Foundation, I've made half or less than I ever made as a professional. Um, and again, the first five years of Mormon Stories, I made pretty much nothing. And then for many years, I made far, far below my market value. It's just been in the past couple of years where my board approved a compensation for me that's comparable to what I was making in 2004 when I worked for Microsoft and then what I made for MIT a little bit later. Um, on the side. And so um, long story short, $2.1 million. It's been amazing. And that money has gone to things like staff. We've had various staff over the years, editors, marketers, project managers, uh, you know, operating officers, et cetera. We've, we've held a lot of events to support people in faith crisis. A lot of those we've made no money off of. I've certainly made no money off of for many, many of those years, rent, equipment, hosting fees, graphic design, et cetera. And you can just go to our 990s and you can see the breakouts of how, how that money's been spent. So that's me being transparent now. And we've always published that information. It's always been available on our websites. People who say we haven't been financially transparent are not being honest. Okay, so here is where things get interesting and, and why we're having this presentation today. Something that I've noticed is that newer churches, so when I say newer churches, let's say older churches or the Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, you know, Islam, uh, you know, Judaism, there's old churches and then there's new churches. Some examples of some new churches might be the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, you know, started in the 1800s, Jehovah's Witnesses and the Church of Scientology. Um, I, I, uh, those are newer churches, churches founded in the last 100 to 200 years. And what I've found is that these newer churches sometimes feel a lot less comfortable with full information being given to their membership and with open and honest dialogue. That's just my, uh, that's just my impression. Uh, it could be right. It could be wrong. That's just my impression. And so, uh, what I've also noticed that these newer churches are often uncomfortable with criticism and with critics. And let me be clear, none of us like, I mean, I like criticism. I don't like mean-spirited, unproductive criticism, but criticism always hurts. And so criticism has hurt me, it, it hurts everyone, and churches are just like humans. Um, they, they sometimes are hurt by criticisms and critics and they feel defensive about it. Um, What's different about churches and maybe other and people is that churches create nonprofits for the purpose of sometimes suppressing information and um, challenging uh, or smearing sometimes critics. And that's, you know, oftentimes what these newer churches do. And um, so, you know, that's what I'm trying to um, argue here. Now, there's a problem with a, a Christian church like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. Um, creating, non, you know, trying to uh, challenge or even attack or even smear their critics. Um, how can a Christian church respond to critics um, if it's supposed to be following Christ? And many people, you know, interpret Christ as being about turning the other cheek, about being kind, compassionate, loving, humble. Um, and so how can, a, how can a Christian church respond to its critics? How can it do so keeping its leaders above the fray so that the leaders aren't dr drug into the muck so that their reputations are these powerful, wise um, men uh, who are, who are Christ-like and good. They have to be, they have to be sort of be kept above the fray. Um, but also the church needs to be kept at arm's length. So the church can't be accountable for these criticisms. So they need to use surrogates who can do the work for the church and help the church avoid any legal or public relations liability. It's a tricky thing. It's one of the tricky things that these newer churches have to do, and, uh, and it's why they create nonprofits. So they create these nonprofits um, uh, to help control the information and the conversation, and frankly, to respond to critics. And so um, four nonprofits that we're going to be talking about today that the LDS Church has helped, has created, frankly, um, 
you could say they're in indirectly created by the church, but I, but but I think we're going to be able to make a pretty case that there's a direct tie between the Mormon Church and these nonprofits. And you can judge for yourself if you think that's true. Um, you may disagree, and that's totally cool. But the four ones we're going to talk about today are the More Good Foundation, Fair Mormon, the Interpreter Foundation, and Book of Mormon Central. So those are the four nonprofits we're going to be talking about today. All right. So let us begin by um, sharing with you what a, a bit of what we know about these Mormon apologetic nonprofits. The first thing that we know about these Mormon apologetic nonprofits, and I'm just going to say as a disclaimer, we've collected all of the 990s for all of these nonprofits. So again, these nonprofits have to file what's called a 990 form each year with the IRS that shows their donations, their, their revenue, it shows their expenses at a high level, and it shows um, they have to report who their large donors are and who their boards of directors are. Um, and all that information is public. And so what we've done is we've collected the um, 990s for Fair Mormon, the More Good Foundation, the Interpreter Foundation, and Book of Mormon Central, and we've analyzed them a little bit. And we've, we're going to make them available on the Mormon Stories podcast website uh, as soon as this presentation is over so that you can analyze these 990s too. And, and um, they show us a lot of important and interesting things. So for example, they, they provide publicly, so I'm not doxing anyone, this is public information that uh, anyone can access. Okay, they show that that wealthy donors like Blake and Nancy Roney from New Skin, Steve Lund from New Skin, Alan and Karen Ashton from Word Perfect, David Neeleman from JetBlue, Spencer Kirk from Extra Space Storage, David and Bianca Liz Lisbony from For Life Research, and many, many, many other super wealthy Mormon donors give their money to these nonprofits. And if you go to um, not all of these 990s that we've collected show who their large donors are, but the ones to the More Good Foundation do show who their large donors are. And so you can go in and look and you can see this information. It's publicly available. And so these big, these super wealthy donors either give money directly to these four nonprofits or what we've discovered is that in some cases, the super wealthy donors give money to the More Good Foundation in at least one year then the More Good Foundation gave money to the Interpreter Foundation, to Fair Mormon, and to Book of Mormon Central. So more on that in just a second, but we know that that is, I'm pretty sure that that's all factual. If you want to verify this, I encourage you to do so. And again, we'll be publishing the 990s very, very soon. So um, I, I was transparent about how much money the Open Stories Foundation has made. Now what I want to do is also share how much money these other nonprofits have made. So how much money are these Mormon apologist nonprofits receiving overall? Um, you'll be able to download these 990s at mormonstories.org, but our analysis shows that over from about 2005, which ironically is uh, the same year Mormon Stories podcast launched. So in same year, uh, based on my understanding, the same year that Mormon Stories launched, um, the More Good Foundation launched. Um, it's probably just coincidence. But from, from that point further, we see the money steadily growing. So for, for let's just say six or seven or eight years, it's about a million bucks to these nonprofits. But then starting around 2012, 2013, 2014, which I think is around the time I gave my TED Talk around 2013, um, you know, Marlon Jensen announced that we're having the greatest apostasy since Kirtland. The Swedish Rescue, you know, started building up from 2010 to 2013. Hans Matson comes out with his story in the New York Times. Um, you know, me and, you know, me and Travis Stratford and Hans Matson, um, you know, and Greg Prince and others work together to present issues to the church uh, about people leaving the church. And, um, and again, eventually my TED Talk for LGBT Mormons, I think, was an issue. Kate Kelly and I getting um, uh, summons that, that we were going to be excommunicated by the church by 2014, I think, was a big deal. Uh, lots of other things. Uh, CES letter coming online, Mormon Expression podcast. You know, lots of things culminated such that by 2012, 2013, or 14, we get the sense that uh, things people started getting really worried. So by 2015, we've got $2 million a year flowing into these four nonprofits. 
Then it jumps to about three, uh, let's say two and a half to three million by 2016. By 2017, these four nonprofits together in aggregate received well over almost seven million, seven million dollars. And then in 2018, it's jumped back down to let's just say three, three and a half million. So while the Open Stories Foundation was, you know, receiving 50,000, 60,000, 80,000, 100,000, you know, uh, eventually maxing out at, you know, 400,000, 450,000, 480,000. We've got these nonprofits sometimes getting over $6 million a year in annual contributions. And what we've done as a courtesy to you is aggregate all the money given to these nonprofits over the past several years. And that's the number. $22.8 million has been donated to the More Good Foundation, Fair Mormon, the Interpreter Foundation, and um, Book of Mormon Central um, over these past years. And actually, that is a typo on that slide. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix that typo really quick because um, it had the Open Stories Foundation on that slide and it didn't belong there. So that's it. That's a number. That's a pretty big number. Look at that number. Okay, $23 million has been given from wealthy donors and the Mormon church to these four nonprofits. Now, don't take my word for it. Maybe we got the math wrong, okay? Um, so please go to these 990s yourself, pull them out, add up the numbers, and check our math. Um, it could be wrong, but, but this is our best guess at how much money these nonprofits have received so far. So the next question is, everybody wants to know this, is the LDS church directly contributing to these nonprofits? And the answer, I believe, is yes. In fact, I think the evidence is undeniable that the answer is yes, but don't take my word for it. Let's look at the data, okay? So um, what what we've what we've observed is that it, it kind of works this way. Um, good, honest, hardworking uh, Latter Day Saints from all over the world give money to the Mormon Church, so they pay their tithes and offerings to the Mormon Church. So the Mormon Church gets a bunch of money, right? And it needs to spend this money, but it can't spend it on. It doesn't want to spend it too much on apologetics. Now it does do the Maxwell Institute. You know, it, it, it does, you know, fund Daniel Peterson and John Gee and, uh, you know, the church history department and the Joseph Smith papers, which uh, project, which isn't mentioned here. We probably should have mentioned whatever foundation funds the Joseph Smith papers project. That's actually an oversight on our part, probably. But anyway, the church has a lot of money into apologetics within its organization. But these, you know, more critical or um, more, more, uh, Strident apologists, the church is is funding uh, through the nonprofit. So the church takes the money from people who donate directly to the church. And then what they do is they give money to organizations like Deseret Trust Company and the LDS Foundation. These organizations are owned and controlled by the Mormon church. So the church gives money to the tithe payers money to the Deseret Trust Company and to uh, the LDS Foundation. As far as I know, if I've got this wrong, somebody please correct me. I don't want to spread it, misinformation. And then what we've found is that in at least one very important case, and actually in many cases, the Deseret Trust Company and um, the LDS Foundation contribute to uh, at least one nonprofit. So in this case, we know that they have given a lot of money to the More Good Foundation, and we don't know if they've given money to the Interpreter Foundation, Fair Mormon, or Book of Mormon Central directly, because I don't believe the 990s actually tell us. They hide who the donors are uh, to those. Um, I'm not saying with, with ill will. Uh, we don't disclose the, name, the names of our largest donors publicly because they're afraid they're going to get hurt by the church or other church members. Um, and, and so we protect their uh, confidentiality so that they don't get hurt. Um, uh, anyway, so, um, so that's kind of how it works. And uh, just to be clear, 
th this is a screenshot that shows that the Deseret Trust Company is in fact owned and controlled by the LDS Church along with the LDS Foundation. Um, and, and so there should be no question about that. Now, the very next slide shows excerpts from the More Good Foundation's 990, okay? The 2017 990 for the More Good Foundation and the 2018 um, 990 for the More Good Foundation. And what you'll see is that the Deseret Trust Company um, donated $1 million to uh, the More Good Foundation in 2017. So if I'm understanding that right, the Mormon Church took tithe payer money, gave it to um, gave it to the Deseret Trust Company, and then the Deseret Trust Company gave a million dollars to the More Good Foundation. Okay, um, in 2018, the LDS Foundation um, gave four hundred thirty thousand dollars to the More Good Foundation, and then the other chart that we have on here are funds donated to the More Good Foundation over time. And what this shows is that from 2009 all the way to through 2018, either the, the Deseret Trust Company or the LDS Foundation gave around a million dollars plus a, a million around a million dollars, a million to two million dollars a year. Sorry, sorry, almost two hundred thousand dollars a year. So between I'm gonna, sorry, let me start over. I'm a little nervous again. Please forgive me. I don't want to say this wrong. I want to get this right. So from 2009 to 2015, uh, the LDS Foundation gave almost $200,000 a year um, to, to the More Good Foundation. And then what we see is in 2017, we have that huge million-dollar jump where, uh, the Deseret, where the Deseret Trust Company gave a million dollars in addition to the $200,000 that the LDS Foundation gave. So that's one point, if I've got my calculations right, that's $1.2 million dollars. Uh, to the More Good Foundation in 2017. And then in 2018, um, the donations from the LDS Foundation increased to $400,000. So in total, what that our best calculations show that 2.9, about more than $2.8 million have been given from the LDS Church and its tithe payers to the Deseret Trust Company and the LDS Foundation, which was then given directly to the More Good Foundation. So I hope I've been able to demonstrate to you that the LDS Church directly funds these apologetic um, organizations. Um, then I want to show one level deeper. What we also discovered from the More Good Foundation's 990, at least in 2018, is that the More Good Foundation directly gives money to the Interpreter Foundation, Book of Mormon Central, and Fair Mormon. So if you look at that 990, it shows uh, the More Good Foundation gave 90 grand to the Interpreter Foundation, 90 grand to Book of Mormon Central, and 120 grand to Fair Mormon. Um, so I hope I made that case. I hope that's clear. I hope I'm not belaboring the point. But that's that's three hundred thousand dollars in total in 2018 from the LDS Church to the More Good Foundation to Fair Mormon Interpreter and Book of Mormon Central. All right. So the next question is: The More Good Foundation has it been honest about receiving direct donations from the LDS Church? And as sad it is, it is, is to say this, I think the answer is yes. They've been dishonest. Let me show you the evidence, and you can decide for yourself if that's true. But what we have here is a screenshot um, of the More Good Foundation, uh, I believe around 2016. So this is kind of what I, I think the More Good Foundation's website said from 2009 to 2016, under the question, does the LDS Church control or operate the More Good Foundation? It says the More Good Foundation operates independently from the more from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It is not managed or funded by the church. Now, that looks like uh, an untrue statement from the More Good Foundation, um, but I could be wrong. So if I'm wrong, I would invite the More Good Foundation or Kurt McConkie or the LDS Church or whoever wants to to correct me because I would never want to be dishonest intentionally or mischaracterize anything that I'm saying here. But it looks like 
the more good foundation was not honest about the money that it directly received from the LDS church. And I would argue you could say that maybe that means the LDS church wasn't honest either um, because I'm guessing it knew that, that the more good foundation was claiming that it did not receive money from the LDS church. Now, please correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. So in total, what we have is 2.9, about $2.9 million going from the Mormon church, tithe payer money going from the Mormon church to the Deseret Trust Company and the LDS Foundation, and then being channeled to the More Good Foundation. I think we've made that point clear. And, and, and some people find this stat very interesting, that in 2017 alone, the LDS church donated 80 plus percent of the total budget for the More Good Foundation with that $1 million from the Deseret Trust Company. So some people think that's really significant, that 80% of the budget of the More Good Foundation in 2017 was provided directly from the Mormon Church through the Deseret Trust Company. So for whatever that's worth. Okay, next question. Uh, what are Mormon apologist nonprofits doing with all this money? Now, I don't know all that they're doing. Um, I know that they hire a lot of writers. I know that they, uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they pay people to write, um, you know, responses to critics. Uh, I'm sure they, I'm sure they do search engine optimization. I'm sure they do all they can to make it so the LDS church's websites uh, go higher in the Google search ranks um, and that the critics of the church, so that their websites go much lower. I know they purchased many, many, many internet donate domains thousands and thousands of dollars of purchases of internet domains so that no one else can use the names like Mormon stories or Mormon expression or whatever. They went out and bought as many domains as they could and sat on them so that ex-Mormons or critics of the church couldn't um, use those domains. Uh, who knows all the ways they've spent their money? I, I wouldn't presume to know, but my sense is, is that a lot of this money these days are in these nonprofits are going towards YouTube. And so what we have uh, a few years ago, well, Fair Mormons had a YouTube channel for I don't know how long. We saw recently, a few, a few years back, um, a, uh, a new YouTube channel, kind of a young, hip version of YouTube called Saints Unscripted. I'm pretty sure that's funded by the More Good Foundation, the Saints Unscripted. That's the first uh, channel that I believe Kwaku, who we're going to talk about later, he started out there. And then recently, two new YouTube channels have been released. One's called Stone 16, and another is called Midnight Mormons. And the truth is, it is hard to know uh, to what extent um, all these YouTube channels are funded by the More Good Foundation, by FAIR, by the LDS Church, by rich Mormon donors. We don't know. Um, but I'm pretty sure they're all connected in, in some very concrete ways. I'll make that case. You can tell me whether you think that's significant or not. So um, what this slide shows is just Kwaku, Kwaku L. He's received um, a lot of positive and negative uh, feedback as of late. Again, he was with Saints Unscripted for a while. I don't think he's with them anymore, although I'm not sure. And uh, recently, Fair Mormon has hired, as I understand it, Kwaku to help with their YouTube channel. Um, and so what we'll see in the next slide is kind of John Lynch and Scott Gordon, uh, who are two of the leaders of the of the Fair Mormon um, organization. There are several other people who are on the board of directors. Daniel Peterson, who we'll mention uh, later, is also has also traditionally, I believe, been on the board of Fair Mormon. And then a lot of these donors, again, uh, donate to Fair Mormon through the More Good Foundation and elsewise. And it seems like what the what the what Fair Mormon has done recently is they hired Kwaku, in addition to whatever he did with the More Good Foundation and um, and uh, Saints Unscripted, he hired Kwaku, who is an actor, and then he hired two other actors, a guy named Brad Whitbeck and a guy named Cardin Ellis. So they've hired these three actors. Um, Cardin's also a podcaster, and I, I I'm pretty sure uh, they've hired them for money. That that these guys are are making money from their work, uh, both with Saints Unscripted, whoever helped out with that, and with Fair Mormon. I think we've we've been able to track the money that went from More Good Foundation into Fair Mormon that then was was used to pay for um, these actors to, to help out with these videos. And then what, what they're doing is these three, these three guys, Brad Cardin and Kwaku, are trying to create more edgy and controversial content, content that's hip, 
um, but content that's a little bit more fierce, a little more savage, as as they like to say, and and that basically goes after critics more directly. They're going after me. Uh, they're going after Jeremy Runnels. They're going after uh, you know lots of people that are no longer members of the church. They call them anti Mormons. That's that's an offensive term to people like me. Um, but but you know we like to call ourselves post Mormons or ex Mormons um, or Mormons. But anyway, they're going after us uh, more directly, more harshly, more intensely. And so you can see just a couple screenshots. One of their screenshots uh, for one of their videos says the CES letter is cringe. Let's destroy it. This is war. And that's a picture of Cardin and Brad and Kwaku. There's another one that, that, that says Mo Wives, Mo Problems. It's basically the review of the CES letter. And in these videos, I guess there's they're, they're hip and cool and they're fun for those who, who like that kind of stuff. But also, um, many people are concerned that they're not giving accurate information, that they're being disingenuous or dishonest in how they relate the facts of these issues. And sometimes they're being really harsh and critical and even mean-spirited, sometimes in mocking critics of the church. Um, and sometimes they're being very dishonest uh, about how they talk about all these issues and about the critics. Um, and they're they're trying to be super funny as well. So this is a picture of Brigham Young with his head uh, cropped over uh, someone with, with his arms around a bunch of women, um, uh, you know, kind of as a polygamist. And so I, I, I think it's cool or interesting that they're trying to be funny. And uh, so that's what they're trying to do. Now, what they're also trying to do, and this is where things for me get really serious, and, and we're asking the question, are these apologetic nonprofits in the LDS church by supporting them, spreading misinformation to smear critics? And, um, you know, I, I, uh, I just want to prevent this evidence and, and ask you guys to decide for yourself if you think, uh, that's going on. And so I'm going to just really quickly, um, uh, I'm going to be sharing some audio in just a second. And, and the purpose is to share with you, um, to let you listen to, uh, you know, what's being said and to let you decide for yourself. Um, in just one second, I have to, uh, I have to enable the audio on this. So I will enable the audio. Okay. I want to make sure that you can hear what I'm about to, uh, about to present. So, um, so what, what we're asking for you in this presentation is, are these apologists and thus these nonprofits and thus the LDS Church, because they're all connected, are they spreading misinformation and are they smearing critics in an unhealthy or damaging or unchristlike way? And in some cases, are they inciting violence that could lead to the harm of people like me, people in my family, people like Jeremy Runnels and others? Are they inciting violence? And we're just going to let you decide because maybe they are and maybe they're not. So the first thing I want to share is um, a, a video from Kwaku and Cardin and um, and Brad, okay? And this is a video where it's about a two-minute video, and it's a it's their it's their sort of claim that um, ex-Mormons are getting rich and making tons of money, gobs of money. Uh, by lying and by intentionally trying to destroy families. So I'm just going to roll the clip and I'm going to let you listen to it and I'll uh, talk about it in just a second. But you know, tell me what you think. Having seen what I've seen, it makes it very difficult for me to believe that Jeremy Runnels is actually honest at all in all of this. I, I think now he's caught up in the money of his CES foundation. Well, that's the right? other thing. And he can't leave it. There's so much money in anti-Mormonism, I can't take these people seriously. Mm -hmm. These cats are making the bank off of this anti-Mormonism. I mean, the freaking faith crisis cruises John DeLynn puts on. Yeah. Like, like, at what point is it not just like, that's literally what the MLMs do. <laughs> offering a yeah. cruise at uh -huh. the end of the summer. He has summer. a life coach MLM you know? called Thrive. I think <laughs> yeah. he is Utah <laughs> to the brim. Um, I like, I talk about like who like, you know, are pulling some of the culture and everything here. And they like, I show them pictures of guys like Jeremy Runnels and they're like, it's the banality what? of evil. 
Like, it's literally like, the this finale is like, in me. This is like a cool guy where you're from. And I was like, yeah, like the. Is no, Utah I, that I, boring? We're like, this is like, I you know what I mean? I wouldn't say cool. The banality of evil, the boringness of evil. And it reminds me, and I do say evil because when you intellectually dishonestly for self-aggrandizement or self-enrichment create materials meant to basically break up families, when you go home wrecking for profit, I call that evil. All right? And, and that's what John DeLynn and Jeremy do is they home wreck for profit. There's no other way of putting it in my mind. Okay. Okay. So those are the claims. And I, I feel like there were many, many dishonest things said, many things that were just that, that to me were, were blatantly untrue in what was just said. And I, I just want to, you know, pose the question, is the LDS church through these nonprofits promoting dishonesty, blatant dishonesty through Fair Mormon, more good foundation and, and supporting these actors like, like, um, you know, Kwaku and, and, and these other guys. So let me just, um, let me just remind you that, you know, they just made the claim that ex Mormons are getting rich, uh, off of ex Mormonism. And I just want to ask you, we showed you this number before 22.8 million dollars put into these nonprofits over the past uh, 15 or so years. And so I ask you, is it honest for them to claim that we're getting rich when, when that type of money is going from the church to these nonprofits to whoever the nonprofits pay? You guys decide that doesn't seem honest to me. In fact, what we have here is a chart that shows what's been donated to the Open Stories Foundation Versus what's been donated to these other nonprofits um, between you know 2005 and 2018, and I just ask you, where who's making the bank? Who's making the bank here? Is it is it us or is it is it the the Mormon apologetic nonprofit industry? Um, you guys make the judge, but it, by my estimation, that's ten times larger. 10 times larger, uh, you know, 1,000, is that 1,000% larger than, uh, than what, what I've been making? Um, so anyway, next, next, next slide. What this shows is how much uh, some of the people are making. And what it shows is that just for the More Good Foundation alone, over $1 million in annual compensation for its employees, uh, $1 million dollars, Again, the the, C, the CEO John, Jonathan Johnson makes at least one hundred seventy five thousand. David Grant makes one hundred thirty thousand. Other employees make one hundred thousand, ninety thousand. So multiple employees for the More Good Foundation are making six figures. Okay, and a million dollars just in in compensation of directors and staff in one year for the More Good Foundation. So I ask you, is it honest? for Kwaku and for these other guys to claim that we're getting rich with these, with, with these types of numbers. I just, that's, a, that's up to you to decide. Now there was a claim made that I have um, been, been holding multiple luxury cruises. I want to say that that is not true at all. It's dishonest. It's a lie. I, John DeLynn have been on one cruise in my entire life. One cruise. A couple of years ago, a bunch of my listeners said, John, will you please host a cruise? We would love to do one of your faith crisis retreats on a cruise. They're intense. It would be a way for us to do the intense work of a retreat and then relax. So um, I planned one I played one cruise. Uh, it was in October of two years ago. Uh, uh, it was not it was not worth it at all. Uh, I, if I had it over to do again, I'd meet all the people I met, but I would not have gone on the cruise. It was not fun. I did not have staff there to help me, uh, in any meaningful way. I ran it all by myself and, uh, it was grueling and I made almost, I made relatively nothing for the time and effort that I put into it. That's one cruise. Okay. They said cruises in that video, cruises, multiple cruises. That's, that's a lie. That's dishonest. What's actually honest, as I understand it, is that Daniel Peterson, 
who is actually the the director of the nonprofit of of he's he's with the Fair Mormon. He's on the board of Fair Mormon, and he's the director of the of uh, of uh, the Interpreter Foundation. He has gone on many, 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 many cruises over the year, making a lot of money. But but Kwaku and 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 those other guys, they don't they don't mention that, and that's dishonest because their own their own guys are going on luxury cruises. I've been on one cruise, made very little money, and and they're representing as if I've been on many. That's dishonest. So that's the LDS Church through More Good Foundation and Fair Mormon being dishonest and misrepresenting the truth to smear me, to make it look like I'm trying to get rich off of hurting people. Um, and, and that's dishonest. Um, I also want to call attention to one of the 990s for the Interpreter Foundation. And what you'll see if you read the 990 in 2019 for Daniel Peterson, the guy I just mentioned, it lists $1 million in a single year for other expenses. And I don't know. I don't know what Daniel Peterson did with that million dollars of other expenses in 2019. I don't know. It could be super legit. It could be not legit. But when we're talking about money, these guys who are friends with Daniel Peterson and, and all these other millionaires channeling tens of millions of dollars in these organizations, they're friends with Daniel Peterson who gets a million dollars in a single year and they're claiming that Jeremy and I are uh, are are doing this for money. Why aren't they turning? Why aren't they turning their scrutiny back on their own people? Why are they avoiding and not sharing this information? It seems dishonest of the LDS Church, of Fair Mormon, of More Good Foundation, and of these podcasters uh, to be uh, sharing manip- sharing information in such a dishonest way. Um, again, Book of Mormon Central. If you go to there, two thousand eighteen. 990, you'll see a million dollars in salaries for staff of the Book of Mormon Central Foundation in a single year. And then in 2017, $1.3 million again in other expenses. Now it's it's normal for there to be an other expenses category in a nonprofit because you can't itemize everything out. But to have a million dollars categorized as other, I think it's fair for you all to go to the Interpreter Foundation, Book of Mormon Central, Fair Mormon, and and the More Good Foundation and ask them, when you guys have millions of dollars in your other expenses category, where's that money going? Can you give us an accounting? Is it going into the pockets of the leaders and the directors? Is it going to friends and family? Is it going to legitimate purposes? Why isn't it categorized in a way to where people can actually see how the money's being spent? So if anybody's going to attack the Open Stories Foundation for its integrity, for its transparency, I think it would be most honest to first look at these other nonprofits and look at them with a critical eye about their honesty and and their transparency. Now, that's just how I see it. You guys may see it differently, but, but, but check out the 990s and see for yourself. So in less than two minutes... Um, these guys, Kwaku and, and Brad and, and the other friends, with the support of Fair Mormon and the More Good Foundation, which which is the support of the LDS Church, they they mischaracterized the money being brought into the Open Stories Foundation and, uh, and others like me. They hid and deceived about uh, about um, and I, I in- unintentionally misspelled Kwaku there. I want you to know that was not uh, intentional. I am. Uh, I'm going to fix that because I know that at some point uh, someone got in trouble for doing that. So, um, so yeah, they've mischaracterized the money going into the Open Stories Foundation. They've mis- they have completely neglected to be honest and open and transparent about the money going into their organizations. They they lied about me having multiple faith crisis cruises for money. They, they hid and ignored Daniel Peterson and other apologists' participation in luxury cruises. Um, they said that I uh, that, that Thrive is an MLM. Thrive uh, has never made any money, ever. Um, we've held a couple of events intentionally at a loss so that we could um, have as many people at these events as possible. Ask any of the people that led these events. The events were intentionally held at a financial loss 
so that we could help as many people as possible. So Thrive, no one made any money off of Thrive, okay? And um, it's not an MLM. They lied. Kwaku lied and said that Thrive is a multi-level marketing organization. I've never been involved in an MLM in my life. Never, not one time ever. In fact, I have I have deep issues sometimes with the way uh, certain MLMs can be unethical at times. And then finally, uh, they make this really egregious smearing claim that uh, that that Jeremy and I are involved in home wrecking for profit. Um, that's a destructive smear that incites people to be angry at us, to hate us, and to want to hurt us. Frankly, um, and and honestly. You could just as easily levy, if you, if you wanted to be mean, you could just as easy, and I've heard ex-Mormons do this, levy the same types of arguments back at Fair Mormon and other nonprofits, uh, you know, apologetic nonprofits, saying that the content that they create creates so much confusion and doubt and anger um, in amongst believing Mormons that it causes tension between uh, non-believing Mormons and believing Mormons and can be harmful to marriages and families. But 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 I want you to know, I'm not making that claim right now and I don't want to make that claim today. I just want to say that that same claim could just as easily be made back to them and uh, I, just, I just don't think they're being honest. So Scott Gordon, John Lynch, uh, you know, podcaster guys, More Good Foundation, uh, Fair Mormon, all of you guys, LDS Church, this is dishonest stuff, um, and it's harmful. In my opinion, uh, you guys decide for yourself. And again, who's making the bank? Twenty-six million dollars to these organizations over the past years. Okay, the next thing, you know, some people. I had some friends look over this. A few friends told me to leave out this clip, but I need to put this clip in. It has to. It doesn't have to do directly with a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, but it's a smear that they levied at Jeremy Runnels. Jeremy Runnels is my dear friend who had a sincere faith, faith crisis uh, several years ago, returned missionary, married in the temple, loved the church, had a faith crisis, wrote up into a document um, his, his concerns about the church and sent it to a, a director of the church education system within the Mormon church, okay? Jeremy's an, one of the most honest people I've ever met. He's one of the good heart, most good-hearted people I've ever met. He has incredible integrity as far as I've experienced. And now I want you to hear what, what Kwaku and these other guys, along with uh, you know, FAIR and, and the More Good Foundation and the LDS Church, by subsidizing all this activity, I, wanna, I want you to hear what they say about Jeremy Runnels. And I want you to listen just very closely to this and how they how they seem to smear him. You know, you got doubts. There's weird stuff in church history. Fine. Write a PDF about it and then and then figure out the problems. But when I find out, when I found out he never actually sent his quote letter to a CES director, yeah, to the actual CES director, and there was proof that he did not. And then when I saw that he recorded the disciplinary council in order to like show the world. It, it became obvious that he was a really poor showman raising awareness, AKA getting attention instead of somebody who had legitimate doubts. Doubts can be dealt with, doubts can be addressed. A desire to be cool comes from an emptiness within that needs to be filled from within and cannot be dealt with externally. And, and when you misrepresent yourself like that, you really, you just, you'd lose me. You're, you're lying. Yeah. And so what they claim, what they claim is that Jeremy Runnels did not actually ever send the CES letter to a director. And I just want you to know that that is an incredibly dishonest claim. You know, you got and what I want you to know, and I want to just say this publicly, because these guys say that Jeremy never sent the letter. And I want you to know that I, I, I texted Jeremy Runnels about this. And I said, Jeremy, these guys are saying you never sent the CES letter. Did you send it? I just want you to know that Jeremy Runnels emailed me the actual letter that he sent um, uh, to the CES director, the entire email chain, the dates, 
the times, the responses, the correspondence, and the CES letter attacked. Attached. I have that letter in my possession, and and I have um, I've seen it, and I have it in my possession. These guys claim in their video that that Jeremy Runnels lied and never sent the CES letter to anyone. And I just want you to know that's a deeply dishonest and harmful lie. And again, Fair Mormon, More Good Foundation, LDS Church. You are subsidizing these, these people to smear people so that they hate Jeremy, potentially so that they want to do violence to Jeremy by telling lies. And, and it's outrageous. Um, in addition to claiming that he just wants to be cool, I think that that's what the whole approach of these guys is, is to come out with a new hip, cool Mormon apologetic. So to talk about Jeremy just wanting to be cool and how that comes from an empty place but then to, uh, you know, being kind of maybe potentially hypocritical about that, it just, it, it feels dishonest and harmful. And, and I think it deserves to be called out. Now we get to the part that I think is, is most disturbing of all. And, and it's the following. Uh, now that these videos have been, uh, you know, shared, these guys, uh, you know, like Kwaku, um, you know, like Cardinellis, they're tweeting uh, through social media to all their followers. They're tweeting to these people all these uh, videos that are that are spreading lies to disparage me, to disparage uh, Jeremy Runnels and others. And what emerged a couple of days ago, maybe just two days ago, was something that was deeply, deeply disturbing. It's a video that was released on Twitter. And it's basically a, a clip from a Quentin Tarantino movie called Inglorious Bastards. I've not seen it. Um, and it basically shows, and, and I was going to show the video, but we decided not to because it's too graphic. And be, because uh, we're worried that YouTube's going to flag it so that you guys won't be able to share this presentation. But what this video shows is a man walking out of uh, an underpass with a bat in his hands. And... And it shows uh, it shows pictures of people like me um, standing in front of the guy with the baseball bat. And then what it shows is the guy with the baseball bat and 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 the the label over the guy with the baseball bat is tits, which stands for um, uh, oh crap, what does it stand for? Um, this is the show. That's one of the names of this. A YouTube channel that Fair is subsidizing. This is the show. So it basically shows, um, you know, Kwaku and his buddies, Fair Mormon in their podcast with a bat in their hands, beating me over the head, pummeling me to the ground, and then pounding with the baseball bat, bludgeoning me by name with my name on the character's chest, bludgeoning me with a baseball bat. And then everybody laughing about it. It also shows a picture of Jeremy Runnels as well. And this is, you know, uh, everyone that I've talked to has seen this, or at least most people. Some people think it's just funny. Um, maybe maybe you think that's funny. Um, that's one, one interpretation. Other people feel like what this is doing is it's inciting violence. That it's basically saying to, uh, to many, many people, uh, in Utah and who love the Mormon church and care about it. It's basically saying uh, you ought to consider doing violence to Jeremy Runnels and John DeLynn. And so um, this video gets shared on Twitter by an anonymous account. I don't know who this person was, Braden Herman. I don't know if that's a real person or if it's just an anonymous account. This video was shared on Twitter, encouraging violence against me and Jeremy. And then it was retweeted retweeted by Cardin and Kwaku. So Cardin and Kwaku retweet this. Um, Kwaku calls it, um, he says, now this is something in his retweet. And then Cardin writes, hey, Braden, Cardin Ellis here. I'm the director of This Is The Show. That's what they mean by tits. Um, love the video. Hook me, you know, hoy me up. I'd like to talk. And so um, this is the part that's been deeply disturbing. And it's been so deeply disturbing that uh, I talked to my wife, I talked to my kids, 
And we decided to file a report with the police department. And Jeremy Runnels decided to do the same because we are literally fearing for our own safety. My children are, are, are fearing for my safety. My children are fearing for my family's safety. Jeremy Runnels is fearing for his safety and his family are fearing for their safety. And if you don't believe that, that these types of videos are capable of inciting violence, let me read to you one of the comments made on the Twitter feeds. It reads um, from someone named Elder Hyde. It's got a picture of a knife with someone's um, hand holding the knife with red, white, and blue, blue colors in the collar. And it says, physically, um, so badly that the people who come to clean her up, they're going to be puking when they see what I did to him. All right? I want them to know how I feel about him. So I'm going to flip him up so bad that he makes them puke when they see his bruised, mangled body. And that is a comment made in response to this video, this video that was shared. Now, I'm going to just also say one thing. I did sh I did uh, post this video in multiple places and share it. I did that th at the advice of a uh, legal counsel who said that I needed to make a copy of this and make sure it was public for my own safety, for the safety of my family, and as a legal record to show that that Kwaku and Cardin and thus Fair Mormon and the More Good Foundation and thus the LDS Church were potentially inciting physical violence against me and Jeremy Runnels and my family. And so that's why I shared it, but it was already out there. And I waited to share it until my kids discovered it because they follow Kwaku. Some of my kids follow Kwaku. I didn't share it. My kids reached out to me. They said, Dad, I'm terrified. Uh, did you see this? What are we going to do? That's when I consulted with uh, legal people, and that's when I decided to go ahead and share this publicly so that everyone would know what was going on, so that the media could get involved. I don't know if the Salt Lake Tribune and the Deseret News follow stories like this anymore. They both seem to be heavily influenced and or controlled by the Mormon Church, so I don't know if the Salt Lake Tribune or the Deseret News are going to be doing any journalism on this. I don't know if KSL cares about uh, stuff like this. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if anyone cares about uh, this kind of stuff anymore. It seems like there's so much stuff going on in the world. I uh, frankly wouldn't blame people for not caring. But um, I wanted to at least let people know that Jeremy and I are, are receiving death threats, um, that our families are being threatened, and that this is in response to people like um, Cardin Ellis and Kwaku uh, supported and funded by the More Good Foundation and Fair Mormon and the LDS Church. As far as I know, um, you guys tell me if I've gotten this wrong, um, but it seems like they're all connected. Uh, they're inciting violence against me and my family, Jeremy and his family. And I just want to say we're scared. We want uh, we want to ask that 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 Cardin and Quaku. Uh, stop doing this sort of thing, that Fair Mormon stops supporting the types of people who incite violence, and that the More Good Foundation, the LDS Church, stop endorsing organizations and nonprofits that incite violence against earnest critics that are literally not trying to destroy families. We're trying to save families. We're trying to alleviate anxiety and depression. We're trying to minimize divorce, and we're trying to help people help the Mormon church get more healthy and help people who leave the church get more healthy. Please stop inciting violence against us. Uh, please stop terrorizing us and our families. Um, that's my request. Um, so I, I want to end with a couple questions. The first is fair Mormon, more good foundation, um, LDS church. Is this approach Christ-like? And some people think that, that, People who uh, lose their faith in Mormonism aren't allowed to talk about Jesus or Christ or even God. I just want to tell you another lie that I believe um, Kwaku and Cardin have told is that is that I'm an atheist. I've never once identified as an atheist that I remember or as an agnostic. I have. I feel like I have always eschewed those terms. Now, I've talked about those things, and sometimes I've described those. I've I've, I've considered those. 
uh, identities, but I've never identified as an atheist or agnostic. But they like to say that we're atheist and agnostic, which for me is a lie. I'm not, I do not identify as atheist or agnostic. But what they also like to say is you're not allowed to talk about God or Jesus, um, you know, if you're an atheist, which is, I think is silly, but I can still talk about the teachings of Jesus Christ that I value and love, even if I'm no longer a Mormon, even if I'm no longer uh, in the church, uh, regardless of what my beliefs are, if I, one of the things I love about, uh, think fondly about the Mormon church, one of the things I value about my heritage in the Mormon church is that um, they taught me to be kind. They taught me to serve others. They taught me to forgive. They taught me to, for, to turn the other cheek. It's what I've tried to do in this video. I, I'm sure imperfectly, but it's what I've tried to do in this video. It's what I've tried to do in Mormon stories. I'm not always successful. But is I want I, I still believe that those teachings that I learned from my parents and from the church that are associated with Christ, but that are also associated with lots of other people, secular and not, love, kindness, humility, forgiveness, charity, honesty, those teachings are important. I still value them. And my question to the Mormon church, to Fair Mormon, to the More Good Foundation, to Kwaku, to, to Cardin, and all these other people is, are you emulating the teachings of Jesus Christ in a way that reflects well on Mormons and on the Mormon church? That's, the, that, that's a question I just want to ask. Everyone's got to decide that for themselves. Everyone's got to dig deep. I've got to dig deep as well. Um, and then finally, I just want to say, because really, we can talk about Kwaku, we can talk about Cardin, we can talk about Daniel Peterson, we can talk about Scott Gordon and John Lynch, we can talk about Cardin and, and, and Kwaku and others. The truth is, the buck of all of this, all of this, starts and stops right here. All of this, we have shown, stems from the Mormon church. It stems from the Mormon church the money that it gets from its tithe payers, the wealthy Mormons who follow the Mormon church, and then all the nonprofits that have been set up uh, by the Mormon church through its members to make these attacks, these smears that are dishonest and now violent. And I just want to ask, I want to ask Russell M. Nelson. I want to ask Dallin H. Oaks, Henry Eyring, Jeffrey Holland, uh, Uchtdorf, all of, you know, uh, um, Christofferson, I want to ask all of these Mormon apostles, prophets, seers, and revelators, is this really what you want? Do you really want nonprofits lying about and smearing your earnest critics? And do you want your nonprofits associating with people who incite physical violence against people who ask questions or criticize the church? terrorizing them and their family members. Is that what you want LDS Church? Is that what you're doing? And if it's not what you intend to do, I assume, I think I'm right. I don't think there's any chance that these humans want the level of dishonesty and and violence um, and, and mean-spiritedness that seems to be coming lately out of Fair Mormon out of these different podcasts. I assume that that's not what, what these prophet seers and revelators want. And so what I know for sure is that these men have the power to stop this. And so I'm asking you, Russell M. Nelson, Dallin H. Oaks, Henry Eyring, Jeffrey Holland, Uch, Dieter Uchtdorf, please use your power and influence to stop this mean-spiritedness, to stop the lies and the dishonesty, to stop the ad hominem attacks, and most importantly, for the sake of my physical health, for my family's physical health and safety, for our peace of mind, for Jeremy Runnels, for his family, please stop these nonprofits and these podcasters who are members of your church. Please stop them from inciting further violence on me and my family. That's my presentation for today. We have had uh, over 1,200 people joining us live. Um, I have to say, this is the largest live audience I've ever had on Mormon Stories podcast. Um, I really, really appreciate everyone who is tuned in. We don't really have a time so much. 
uh, to, to take comments and questions. I wanted to keep this thing to an hour or less. We're already at an hour and 50 minutes. So uh, please give us feedback at mormonstories at, at, at gmail.com. If you want to support organizations that are trying to do good in this space, I'm going to give you a list. You can, you can right now donate to Mormon Stories in the Open Stories Foundation. Support Mormon Mental Health Podcast with Natasha Helfer Parker. Please support Year of Polygamy Podcast with Lindsay Hansen Park. Please support Sunstone Educational Foundation. They're doing good in the world. Please support um, uh, the the podcast uh, RFM uh, RFM Podcast. Uh, oh my God, I can't believe Radio Free Mormon Podcast. Bill Real. Please support. Um, uh, Marriage on a Tightrope podcast with Alan and Katie Mount. Uh, Thoughts on Things and Stuff with Jonathan Streeter. There's so many amazing... Uh, please support Dialogue Foundation, an amazing organization spreading truth. Please support the Mormon... I don't know about the Mormon History Association. That's up to you. Support Dialogue Foundation, please. Support the John Whitmer Historical Association. There are so many good nonprofits. So please support the Smith Pettit Foundation that supports Signature Books um, as well. These are amazing organizations doing so much good. Please support these organizations. Please donate money because you can see they're outspending us a thousand to one in terms of dollars. If I got my calculations right, hundred to one, whatever it is, they're way outspending us. We need your support. Um, email us. You can donate at mormonstories.org. Uh, we'll create a list of all the different other nonprofits you can donate to. Um, support Carolyn Pearson. She's a dear friend of mine. She has an amazing book out right now. We need your support to keep doing uh, these sorts of things. Um, so please do that. Please give us your feedback. If we got anything wrong in this presentation, I want to know about it. Email me at mormonstories at gmail.com. I would love to correct the record. If you've got other further information that you think could help people, please email me at mormonstories at gmail.com and let us know. Huge thanks to Gerardo. Um, for helping with this presentation, along with several close family and friends that gave me feedback. I love you guys, and I want to just make a final commitment to you. Uh, I don't care who attacks me. I don't care what mean-spirited things people say about me anymore. People have said so many lies about me, that I'm trying to get rich, that I hurt women, that I hurt children, that I have several mansions all over the place, that I'm embezzling money. As far as I know, all of that's false. I want you to know that I, I have always done Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation to help people. I'm going to keep doing this. I don't care what critics say about me. I don't care how mean or vicious they get. My goal and my commitment to you is to respond with facts, to, to engage in discourses that are evidence-based, not to debate or argue, but to shine light on the world, to promote healing and growth, to promote hope, growth and healing within the Mormon church, and to promote growth, healing, and community outside of the Mormon church. I will not get in debates and, and flame wars with critics. I will not respond to mean-spirited character assassinations, or at least I'll do my best never to. And what I promise is I will do my best. Sometimes I get too angry. Sometimes I get too animated. Sometimes I've contributed to the inflammation. And sometimes I've even said mean things about people. So I'm going to own that. I have not always been perfect in how I've characterized friends of mine, like Patrick Mason um, and, and other people, people that I generally respect, like Richard Bushman, Terrell Givens, Fiona Givens, Spencer Fluman. Sometimes I've lost my temper and have been angry, or um, I, I've been mean to, to John Gee and Daniel Peterson and others. And I just want to say, I want to recommit to kindness. I want to commit myself to doing the best that I can to um, use whatever resources you invest in me in spreading truth, in spreading awareness, in encouraging healthy discourse and dialogue, and in promoting light and healing and growth within the Mormon church and for people who leave the church. That is my commitment to you. I've been imperfect in the past. I will do my best going forward to do that. If you want to assassinate um, me physically or in your words, just know that that's not going to stop me. I'm not going to engage in that type of behavior. I'm going to recommit to honesty, 
light and truth and healing and growth. And I'm going to do my best to ignore this sort of stuff in the future, other than to report it to the police or the FBI if and when it reaches or passes a certain point. And I want to call on everyone to consider joining me. I want to call on ex-Mormon Reddit, all the followers of the Mormon Stories podcast community. If you're willing, if you'll consider this, I know you don't like to be told what to do. Let's stop. Let's not character assassinate Kwaku. Let's not character assassinate Cardin. I don't want to see people attacking them. Let's stop character assassinating Daniel Peterson or John Gee or any of these people. Let's stop that. I don't want to see it on the things I'm associated with. And I want to ask you to let's move to a conversation about evidence, a conversation about logic, a conversation about healing and kindness and growth. And let's do that. If you're willing in ex-Mormon Reddit, let's do that on the Mormon Stories podcast community. Let's do it on Twitter. It's not going to fully happen ever, but I want to do my part and I want to call on everyone within my voice to consider doing your part as well to encourage dialogues of healing and growth. I'm sorry for where I've messed up. I'm going to do that in the future. Thanks so much for all uh, you who tuned in today. I love and appreciate all your support. Thanks for all the heartfelt warm wishes um, to, to everyone who's been concerned about my health and safety and Jeremy Runnels. Uh, thanks to my wife and kids that have borne far too much stress and sadness and fear. Uh, if there were a time to get emotional, it would be right now as I'm talking about Mar Margie and my kids that have borne the brunt of, of all of this stress and um, mean-spiritedness and, and now violence. I want Margie and the kids, I want you to know I love you guys. I care about you. I'm so grateful that you're willing to let me do this. And I'm so sorry, uh, Margie and the kids, for all the pain that all of this has caused you and for the stress that it has put on you. And I thank you so much for your encouragement and love and support over the years in helping me do what I do. Um, and I'll be talking with you guys, you know, Margie and kids in the next few days about what we're going to do in the future because things have gotten really intense. So I love you, Margie and kids. I love you, my family. I love all of you who have listened today. Please stay in touch. Please take care. And we'll see you guys all again soon on another episode.